Dr. Marcia Castro is Andalo Professor of Demography, Chair of the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Co-Director of the Brazil Studies Program of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. Her research focuses on the development and use of multidisciplinary approaches to identify the determinants of infectious disease transmission in different ecological settings to inform control policies. She earned a PhD in demography from Princeton University. Hello and welcome to Friendly Pharmacy 5. My name is Lindsay Dixon. I am a pharmacist here from British Columbia, Canada. Today, we will be discussing the COVID-19 pandemic and how this is uh, rolling out in, or how, what is happening in Brazil right now, and how this has much to do with the third wave that we are experiencing in Canada right now. I have a very special guest with me today, Dr. Marcia Castro. Dr. Castro is an Andalo Professor of Demography and Chair of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Marcia, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. Glad to be here. So Marcia, we know that Brazil is experiencing a very difficult time in the pandemic, and they, they have been all along, but especially right now. Recently, the deaths, death toll in Brazil passed 340,000 people, and also there were 4,000 new cases or new deaths, I believe, just yesterday. Um, I have heard reports that the hospitals are becoming overwhelmed. There are protocols now in place in some hospitals for, for who gets ICU care. Could you just give us a little bit of uh, an update on, on what it looks like in Brazil right now and, and how we got to this place in Brazil? Sure. So um, I just saw the number for today. You mentioned the 4,000 deaths. So today was 4,200 deaths, a little oh. bit over that. So it's the number, we, we're breaking records every day. So um, um, to make a long story short, um, what happened is that since this virus arrived in Brazil last year, um, the position from the federal government has been um, a very worrisome one. So it's denying the importance of the virus. It's uh, completely denying science. There is no scientific committee to advise on decisions, for example. Um, and really favoring the economy over health, as if you can really put those things into different boxes. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so on the one hand is those things, it's not doing the things that had to be done, but there is more to that. It's, it's actually doing the wrong things. So mm -hmm. the Brazilian government has promoted the use of hydroxychloroquine. Um, and we have the issue of infodemics. Every country is going through the dissemination of um, fake news. Mm -hmm. But in the case of Brazil, the government itself is disseminating some of this um, fake news. It, and, you know, the president comes and say, I'm not going to use a mask. You don't have to use a mask. Lockdowns have no effects. Um, and uh, the president himself had COVID. And yeah. um, a few days after, he was outside shaking hands with people mm -hmm. so you know uh, it, it's it's really a combination of not doing the right thing doing the wrong thing not using the health system that brazil has brazil has a universal health system more mm -hmm. than three hundred thousand community health agents that work in very well defined areas serving a defined population and they live in those areas so they they serve the area they live they are trusted by the population they serve, and they know where are the elderly, people with comorbidities. So they were never embedded in the response to this pandemic. So in normal circumstances, or even what we saw when Zika virus arrived in Brazil, they would be the, the heart and soul of the response to the pandemic. They would be right there at the front, identifying people, isolating people, identifying the moment people have symptoms. So some sort of surveillance, containment, uh, contact tracing, everything combined. They were never incorporated. To this day, there has been no spatial uh, trainment, uh, training for those community health agents. Some of them still have no idea how they would manage a case 
if they encounter mm. one. Um, they didn't receive protective equipment. So it was a sequence of mistakes, uh, of wrong decisions, which left Brazil really without a coordinated response. Mm -hmm. Brazil has no communication plan, solid communication campaign that brings the right information to people. Um, and then what we had was a peak last year, a really bad one, um, and Manaus, uh, the capital of Amazonas in the heart of, of the Amazon. We all heard what happened. It, they run out of hospital beds, was one of the first places that run out of hospital beds. Other cities followed suit. Um, there were surveys uh, doing serology that identified Manaus had about 76% of the population had been infected by October. And, and then, you know, we had the peak, horrible, all those deaths, the numbers were crazy. We, we, we stayed several, it was more than a month. Every day we had about more than a thousand deaths per day. And at that time, you know, everybody was terrified. And, and, and that if you look at the curve for Brazil, it almost looks like Brazil reached a plateau. There wasn't a plateau. It was basically the, the epidemic moving from one place to the other. So when you look at the curve for Brazil, it looks like it's not going anywhere. It's just moving. We're not containing anything. So it's just going from one place to the other. So when cases and deaths went down, that would be the time when, okay, let's try to do what we didn't do before to try to prevent a new wave. Let's bring the agents. Let's start um, testing more people. Let's uh, try some contact tracing, um, right? So you would try to do something to avoid another wave. None of that was done. Um, the end of the year is coming. We had elections in November, but they were actually well organized. But then here comes... Christmas, New Year, big celebrations in Brazil. Governors, mayors were anticipating things and telling people, please, uh, and the summer was starting for us as well in Brazil, right? That's the end yes. of the year. Mm -hmm. Telling people, please don't, don't go to bars, don't go to the beaches and, and be careful. We're not done with this. We had so many illegal parties going on at the end of the year, people agglomerating, not using masks. So when it was around December or so, that's when we had the new the new wave again in Manaus. And then we were all over the news. Manaus, not only this time, not only run out of hospital beds, they run out of oxygen. Mm -hmm. And since then, um, we are in a chaotic situation. It's really a humanitarian crisis. Uh, we have new variants circulating in Brazil. P1 is, I think it's the most dangerous one. It's about 1.4 to 2.5 times more transmissible. Uh, it is the dominant one now. It's the most prevalent um, um, uh, uh, strain lineage circulating mm -hmm. in the country. Um, almost every state has hospitals at capacity or almost at capacity. There are long lines waiting for an ICU bed. And now we are breaking records of deaths. Um, you know, it's now above 4,000. And then you would ask, well, what is the government doing? The president still thinks lockdowns are not necessary. Mayors of some cities are facing major opposition mm -hmm. and even death threats, but some of them close the cities. Um, we have one example in the interior of Sao Paulo that a city called Araraquara, uh, they yeah. closed the city the mayor received that threat, but they did it. They did it right. And they have three days in a row without a single death. So it works. It does work. Mm -hmm. um, the emergency benefits the government was giving to the population ended in December. It only started again now. So January, February, March, people were not receiving. And it, you have more people without jobs and so on. So after 17 years, we have hunger again in Brazil, which we didn't have. So there is a lesson to the world here. If you don't do anything, if you think you are done with this pandemic, if you relax too fast, it can come back and it can come back with a vengeance mm -hmm. because the second wave in Brazil is way worse than the first wave. And without any action happening now, without enough vaccines, because 
Brazil didn't secure enough vaccines last year when they had the chance. Now we are back on the end of the line. Mm -hmm. um, so without a chance of protecting, immunizing its population with vaccines um, and without doing anything, I, it's terrifying to imagine how April could be in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And only in the first six days of this month, we were following the numbers. If you look at Brazil uh, total, we had in the first six days of, of, of April, more deaths than births. That never happened in Brazil. Oh. If we look up to today, the total number for Brazil, it's slightly more births. But if you look by region, some regions have way more deaths than births. Never. We saw this, and I'm a demographer. I mean, we followed those numbers. Yeah. We never had this before. So it is a message. We're not done yet. No country is going to be done until all the other countries are done. And if we don't do anything and relax too fast, it's going to come back. Wow. Yes, that's that's really, really difficult news to hear. And I hope that all Canadians do, do hear this. Uh, what you're saying, because this does affect affect Canada and affects the world, what is going on in Brazil right now. You touched on something um, interesting. I know that Brazil, how, what is Brazil doing as far as uh, genome sequencing goes? Because I know that research is very, is very strong in Brazil and you, you do have the capacity to do research and development. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, about that and what that looks like in Brazil right now? It's a great question, Lindsay. So, um, Two points. The first is uh, Brazil has a phenomenal scientific institutions, mm -hmm. phenomenal universities, and a fantastic cadre of researchers. Um, and there is a, a piece um, that came out in Science yesterday, um, basically, again, exposing a reality of what's going on in Brazil right now. There is a lack of funding for research, but some researchers are facing retaliation because of the type of research they do. So a scientist recently uh, you know, published a paper in science showing the issues of deforestation and, and this person is receiving death threats. Um, and the, the scientist that did the study showing that chloroquine didn't have any effect against COVID equally received a threat. So, this is sad to say because there's so much potential and Brazil is doing so much, is generating so much knowledge. But, you know, again, that's something we haven't seen probably since the military regime is that scientists fear, um, you know, for their security because of the research that they're doing. This is just unimaginable. Terrific. In terms of um, um, genomic sequencing, that's a very important point. Um, that's something the world does not have, Lindsay. I wish we had a network of genomic surveillance that mm -hmm. is based on epidemiological basis, right? So you have epidemiological and genomic surveillance that the world is connected in this network and we can actually identify new pathogens when they emerge. That would be the goal for new things. And when you have ongoing epidemics or pandemics, you can identify mutations and new variants, new, new lineages. So Brazil is part of a network that every year sends information to the WHO to decide how the, the flu vaccine should be elaborated, right? So because we have a new vaccine every year. So Brazil is part of this network. Um, it's a lab in, in, in Fiocruz in Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. but it's not designed to be a genomic surveillance, right? Okay. It's designed to have enough information so we can produce the flu vaccine. So the, the, the sequencing that is being done in Brazil, it, it increased now because we need to try to find out if we have new variants and which variants are circulating. So mm -hmm. there is more sequencing being done, but we, are, we can't say we have a good genomic surveillance. We are far from that. Again, if we had um, a government committed to provide a response, there would be enough support to actually get together um, the labs at Fiocruz, right? That is already in this network, but bring the public universities that have labs that can do sequencing. Bring the private labs. They're doing several tests. They're right there, they have the sample. So bring all those people, we are in an emergency and get the testing gone, and then you can identify 
the variants, what, whatever is emerging here or there. We don't have that. So we have brave scientists doing a lot of sequencing and they're the ones putting the studies out showing here we have P1, here it's more transmissible. They're the ones doing this, but we are not even close to have a solid genomic surveillance that can allows us to anticipate the problems that we're seeing now mm -hmm. in this case related to the variant. But honestly, nobody has that. I mean, the country that sequenced more was the UK, yes. but not even the US. We can say the US has a genomic surveillance that allows to actually pick those things up. Mm -mm, we don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I would like you to comment. You said a little bit earlier about choosing the economy versus health. And I know that that has been something that has been a bit of a struggle or a conversation in Brazil. Uh, it has been a conversation here in Canada as well. Could you just comment on that as someone who is more of an expert in this field, why you cannot choose one or the other when you are in a pandemic? Great, I'm glad you asked because it's always good to try to explain those things. So <laughs> Not um, imagine if you have a, a virus like this that, you know, it is gonna, the transmission involves people, you know, getting in contact with each other. They talk to each other without a mask. It's, you know, that's how you're going to have the transmission. It's not the surfaces. People are cleaning things too much, but it, right. it's really not that, yeah. right? Okay, so then um, uh, the, the, the right strategy is if immediately, and we were talking about this language last year, the, the sort of uh, bringing the curve down, right? Yeah. So the whole idea of this is, is if you contain it really fast, you prevent the curve from really going all the way up. Uh, you prevent a scenario where your hospital system is you know, near a collapse, so you can't provide good care. A lot of people are going to die. So that's what you're trying to prevent. Mm -hmm. How do you react really fast? You have to contain the virus. To contain the virus, you have to stop people from getting touched with each other. So you have to do two things at the same time and well done. You close it and you provide people enough financial support so they don't have to go out because they rely, rely on informal job. Right. They don't have to go out because they have a small business that if they don't open, it's going to, it's going to, have to collapse it's going to crash mm -hmm. so what would what happened in many countries is that you close but it's not really a well done closing so it's not going to contain fast enough mm -hmm. and either you don't provide anything or you provide some financial support but because you're not doing the right thing in here in containing the virus it lasts for too long and then the government say oh i don't have enough money i have to stop paying you mm -hmm. so the point is you have to do both things together. And why are they important? If you have a sick population, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter if you have the economy going, you're not gonna have enough labor force, productive labor force, you can't run your business. So mm -hmm. you need a healthy population to be able to have development. And you need the development to feed back into supporting all your programs. So those things go along together. The point is, one, some governments didn't want to close because they're going to save the economy and they want because yeah. you have, I mean, the only, I think the only part of the economy that is prospering in this pandemic is the, you know, the funeral houses. Seriously, yeah. they're mm -hmm. the only ones that are in business nonstop. I'm sorry to say, but that's the truth. Mm -hmm. So you have to think that if you optimize the way you contain the virus, you are also saving the economy, but they have to come together. In Brazil, they never came together and the containing part was never done in a serious way enough to resolve the thing in a short period of time. So you didn't have to keep paying this benefit for too long. Mm -hmm. It was very similar here in the US. It was not much different. The key difference in the US is that we had an election and then things could change. Um, honestly, if we didn't have that election, it would be, we wouldn't be near where we are in terms of vaccination and, and you know, just talking so much about science and getting data, even getting access to data. So, you know, but it started very much like Brazil, actually. Hmm. 
Hmm, that's very, very interesting. Uh, so I was also wondering if you could speak a little bit about uh, the situation that we saw in Manaus. You already mentioned that a little bit. And uh, just a lot of, there are, there's still a common thought where um, people think that if we allow this virus to spread, we could have this herd immunity effect and then maybe, you know, we wouldn't have to worry about vaccinations. Could you just speak to that? Because now we see a variant in Manaus that does not care whether there was infection previously. So could you just speak to that a little bit? Because I think that that, that idea is still very much uh, not uncommon. Yes, it's true. And I'm, I'm glad you asked. So it's always important to talk about this. So first of all, um, the concept of herd immunity is only makes sense if you're talking about vaccines, mm -hmm. period. Herd immunity is not going to be a strategy letting the, the natural course of an infection, particularly with, with a disease like this. Why? Because the price is human lives. Yes. We shouldn't even be talking about this. Yeah. So herd immunity makes sense when you have vaccines. And what is the idea? If you vaccinate enough people, you have enough people to sort of block the virus from infecting. So even if some of those people don't take the vaccine, if you have enough to not allow the virus you know, to spread, you will have herd protection. That's, yeah. that's the concept. The idea that you just let things go basically means you're going to kill so many people in an totally unnecessary way that mm -hmm. it's it's unethical it's inhumane we mm -hmm. shouldn't be talking about this mm -hmm. but but we have our minister of of the economy just said i think three days ago that in in three or four months brazil is going to reach herd immunity at what price now here's another problem with the, this idea of herd immunity if you let the transmission go unmitigated right because you believe in herd immunity. The more intense is the transmission, the more you put pressure on the virus to change itself. I mean, that's the life of a virus. It's gonna change to be able to keep infecting Survive. people, keep mm -hmm. going into different bodies, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when we have the mutations, that's when we have the new variants. Why did we have all those variants of concern in the UK, in South Africa, in Brazil. Why didn't we have them in New Zealand? Because there's not enough transmission in New Zealand to, so the virus faces this pressure and then the need to mutate. We're gonna have new variants emerging exactly where you have intense unmitigated transmission. So even if you think of this way, which is important, we are all worried with the variants, right? B1 is spread. Here in the US, some states are transmission is going up and they're worried this could be of the variant. So, so if we let this idea of herd immunity, one, you're gonna kill a lot of people. Two, you're probably not gonna reach herd immunity because you create the ideal conditions for new variants to emerge. And some of them may completely evade the protective immunity of a previous infection. So you could have reinfection. So, this whole idea of herd immunity is a dead end, no pun intended, but it's really a dead end. Mm -hmm. And it's not a strategy that anyone in public health would ever advise a government to do. Of course, if, if you have a government that don't listen to the scientists, then it could become a strategy. And that's what we're seeing. But it's important that your, your viewers understand the concept of herd immunity only applies when you have immunization. Now that we have vaccines being applied, let's start talking about herd immunity. Now it makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you just have a, a pandemic, an epidemic, a virus is spreading, there is no concept of herd immunity for Pete's sake. We need to contain that disease and minimize the loss of human lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and so as we look at vaccination here in Canada and in Brazil, uh, Canada and Brazil do have some similarities in that we are also struggling with vaccination. I think Brazil has vaccinated maybe 2% of their population. Canada is hovering around 5%. Of course, we have a smaller population, but we are definitely 
struggling and the variants, as you know, are, are uh, you know, get going much faster than, than we can keep up with. Uh, so how can you tell us a little bit about vaccination in Brazil and uh, maybe what, what we could do as a global community to help? Because I do think that this is something that, that the global community should be, should be interested in as well. Yeah, so I think I think Brazil now is close to ten percent. Oh, okay. Uh, it's it, it's sure. still very small, but um, so the thing is, a lot of countries started to buy vaccines um, mid last year, mm -hmm. and in July Pfizer offered vaccines to the Brazilian government and they denied. Mm -hmm. um, Janssen offered and they denied, and F Janssen Johnson and Johnson did phase three in Brazil. Yeah. And that's that would be the ideal vaccine for Brazil. It's one shot, yes. no special refrigeration. You can take it everywhere. That would be the vaccine Brazil should be dreaming of, right? Mm -hmm. But they didn't get it. Um, at the time, um, the first contact with the Sputnik uh, from Russia, um, following recommendations from former President Trump, Brazil denied <laughs> buying the vaccines. Wow. Um, and then there was an um, uh, initiative from the governor of Sao Paulo to make agreements with Sinovac, Coronavac, yes. the Chinese. Yes. The, the federal government didn't want, but the government of Sao Paulo did. Butantan, which is the main institution um, in Sao Paulo, we have two institutions that produce vaccines in Brazil, Butantan and Fiocruz. So then it became, you know, it's producing for the entire country, but it was an initiative of the state. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was an initiative of Fiocruz that then secured the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, those are the two vaccines Brazil has. Uh, Brazil was still relying on the, the main component to come uh, from abroad. So for the Oxford AstraZeneca, I believe it was coming from India. For Coronavac, it was coming from China. Mm -hmm. But by the time Brazil starts approved and it was going to start the vaccination, that's when you know China is vaccinating, India is vaccinating, and the country says, no, you're not going to send it anywhere. First, mm -hmm. we're going to vaccinate ours. So th then it becomes the whole issue of the geopolitics of, you know, vaccines of both production, distribution, prices, and all of those things. So, mm -hmm. so basically, um, the hope is that the technology transfer will happen soon. So Brazil can produce in the country the main component and then produce the vaccines. That's going to speed up the production. But we just don't have enough doses. We should have secured other doses, even Pfizer and Moderna for in, in the major urban centers, we can apply the vaccine. Yeah. It's not a problem. Of course, you're not gonna send this one to the Amazon region that has to go by boat and mm -hmm. no, we won't, but that's why you need multiple vaccines. So Brazil missed the boat. They missed the chance to buy the vaccines last year to be in the front of the line. Now you can have all the money in the world. The vaccines have, a, you know, they have to deliver to the countries that already bought. There is the COVAX uh, facility and, and yeah. Brazil got a few doses of those. Mm -hmm. And they have to worry with all the global south that is barely being vaccinated. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much lack of equity in how this is happening. Yeah. So it's a big problem. And, and there are a lot of people discussing, um, and I feel a little bit divided on this. I mean, on the one hand, as a Brazilian, I would like the, the, the entire community to look at Brazil as a global threat to, to health. And it is, it is a threat yeah. to global yeah. health. And, and somehow try to come up with additional doses so they could speed up vaccination. On the other hand, I feel bad to think that way because how about all the other countries that barely have vaccinated anybody, they also need vaccines. So it's, it's a very difficult situation. And um, I can understand if the community decides to help Brazil, but I can also understand if they say, sorry, we cannot do anything. It's not an easy decision, but I think what everybody has to remember is viruses don't respect borders. So if a lot of variants start emerging in Brazil, I'm sorry, this is not a Brazilian problem. This is everyone's problem. Mm -hmm. So um, 
that's pretty much what we have right now. But it's going slow. Um, I think it's going to continue to go slow for a few months unless something happened from the global community to help out Brazil to speed up. And I don't know what was the issue in Canada, if it was an issue of not acquiring doses either. But, you know, the, the threat of having a very slow vaccination is if you also have an increase in transmission, you have ideal conditions for variants and um, or you have you can have introduction of some of those variants and then everything becomes more difficult because if on the one hand you're not vaccinating enough, on the other hand, you may face a major pressure on your health system, on your hospital care. And, and again, the end result of all those problems is always going to be losing lives, which is mm -hmm. never a good outcome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And I would like you to speak a little bit. Could you tell us in Canada, because we are we are experiencing now the rise of these variants and the B117 variant is becoming dominant, has become dominant in my province and some other provinces. This is something that, uh, it, you know, the, our governments are taking measures, but they is something that seems to be just accepted that these variants will now become dominant. This is the life that we're living right now. And I'm particularly concerned about the P1 variant, which is uh, spreading and uh, the cases are rising very dramatically right now in British Columbia uh, in a particular geographical region right now but could you tell us a little bit about what your understanding is of the p1 variant and why we should be concerned about this here sure so what we know about this variant and again coming from analysis sequencing that was done mm -hmm. by different groups in Brazil is that one it is more transmissible, which means it quickly becomes the dominant one. If you sample, uh, if you take a sample of cases in your area and you do sequencing, it's going to be the most uh, predominant one in that area. So that's one point. That's always a concern because anything that spreads too fast, we saw what happened in the UK with their own mm -hmm. variant. The second thing is that we have documented cases that this variant can lead to reinfection. Yes. And why do I say limited? Because a lot of the cases we had last year, we don't have samples anymore. Uh, and if you look at the definition from WHO to characterize a reinfection, you need two PCRs and, and you need to do the sequencing. And for mm -hmm. some of those cases, we don't have that anymore. Um, or maybe some of the cases we didn't even have a test because we didn't have enough tests. But we have documented cases with samples in both of them showing that it's a completely different lineage. First infection, one lineage, the second one, P1, both of the infections had symptoms. Um, mm -hmm. The first one that was documented was in Manaus and it was eight months apart. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. So, so, and, and again, that's the other concern. We don't know how much of this huge increase in cases we're seeing in Brazil now, mm -hmm. and for that matter, in Canada, I don't know, mm -hmm. how many of those are reinfections? Mm -hmm. We don't know that. What we know is that P1, besides being more transmissible, can cause a reinfection. So when you put those two pieces together, so you have a lineage circulating that um, you know, circulates really fast and it can reinfect people, then, then you have a big problem. And that's not a surprise why they become so prevalent. That's what we know so far. Um, as more samples are being collected, people are really trying to make an effort to be able to assess if we are having reinfections or not. So I would expect this knowledge will also advance in the coming, you know, weeks, um, mm -hmm. I, I hope. But that's what we know so far, and that's enough to make us a very, very concerned. That's why it's called a variant of concern. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have any documentations of reinfection or that it's more transmissible, it would be a variant of interest. And we have some of those. But the variants of concern is when we at least know that they're transmit faster. And in this case, most likely reinfections as well. And something else that I heard was that you are seeing more infection in younger people with this variant as well. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so we've, we've been looking at those data and uh, we have, um, there, is, there is no significant changes in the patterns of mortality. Okay. But we're having uh, more people starting at 40. So between 40 and 60 that are being hospitalized that we were not seeing before. <clears throat> we still have the older also being hospitalized, but there is this sort of um, younger pattern of hospitalizations that are happening. If in the short term, we will also hear, see a sort of younger pattern of mortality. We haven't really seen something to, to be significantly different from before, but for, for hospitalizations, we are seeing that already. Wow. wow. Okay. And do you think that in that demographic, uh, is vaccination or pandemic fatigue playing into that at all? Like here in Canada, we've vaccinated a lot of our elderly people already, and we are seeing um, cases in more young people now. And it's thought that, you know, maybe because these older people are already protected, then the cases now move into, into the younger demographic. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it could be. Uh, but I think like pandemic fatigue, I think everybody has a little bit. Yes, for we sure. We probably have some yeah. too. Um, but the thing is, I think that once vaccination starts, there has to be a very strong messaging that just because you're vaccinated, you cannot lower your guard. Yes. You still have to use the masks. If all your family is vaccinated, maybe you can have dinner and, and but you gotta be careful. It's not what happened recently here in the US that you know everybody was traveling. <laughs> it was like mm -hmm. a record of people at airports. Mm -hmm. No, it's too early for that. Mm -hmm. You wanna go to a restaurant? Um, check the ventilation if the restaurant, if it's really good, that matters a lot. So Yes, you're vaccinated, that's phenomenal, but you're not done yet. We're not done yet with this pandemic. So I don't. I think that in some places, this messaging is not as strong enough um, and it has to be. So, um, so that's one thing. And the message is not just for the people that got vaccinated, but also for the younger people, because you can have a scenario where, well, if the elderly, who are the people in the higher risk, they're vaccinated, I'm also in good shape now because I'm young and they are protected. So now we can do things we didn't used to do before. Again, not yet. So mm -hmm. we don't have enough people vaccinated to give us the herd protection. Now we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, we are yet to see it, to what extent the vaccines prevent um, an infection and transmission. They prevent severe cases, they prevent hospitalizations, they prevent deaths, but you can still get something, not have any symptoms and pass it on. So this messaging about what is okay to do and not okay to do for people that got the vaccine and for people that didn't get the vaccine has to be very well done. And I don't think we are doing this, uh, at least certainly not in Brazil, not enough. So mm -hmm. I believe that there's some sense of we're getting there. Uh, I can relax a little bit. This is happening among some mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what we're seeing in a little bit of vaccine, maybe hesitancy in Canada is people are saying, if, well, if I can't change my life after the vaccine and if life doesn't go back to normal, why should I, why should I get vaccinated? What would you say to those people? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, development of the vaccines is one of the greatest achievements we've had in science, one mm -hmm. of the greatest achievements we've had in public health. Yeah. I would love people to read more history and, and look how the middle ages used to be. I mean, mm -hmm. mortality among children was extremely high. Mm -hmm. uh, people had to live with, uh, you know, uh, disabilities because of diseases that, you know, we didn't have vaccines. Mortality, even among adults, was extremely high. So the world without vaccines was a very frightening world for a, for a couple to put a child in the world because mm -hmm. the, the chances you're going to lose that child um, were very high. So I would urge people to reflect on the difference vaccines made for the survival, for the well-being, for the 
development, the productive capacity that we have in the world. Um, and I would also urge people to really reflect why, why are you against the vaccine? Mm -hmm. um, because if it's because of the history of autism, um, please be informed. I mean, those things were all fake. Um, if it's because it was developed in less than a year, that's not a problem. That's actually phenomenal. It's yeah. because of the advancing science that we're able to do a vaccine in less than a year. And now we have groups trying to think, can we do mRNA vaccines for other diseases? And I work with malaria, that's one of them. And that would be fantastic. Yeah. So, so I would urge uh, those people to engage in more conversations, to talk about those things um, with other people, and to really understand how absolutely fantastic vaccines are for the world. And just imagine yourself in a world without vaccines. I cannot even imagine mm -hmm. that. I mean, I, I come from a generation that I, I actually had, um, I had rubella, I had, uh, I had, I had, let's see, I had uh, measles, um, I, I had so many things. And now there are a lot of vaccines for those things and we don't need to have that anymore. But I put myself in my mom's shoes. She was always worried because she knew kids would get that and she had to be attentive. The moment we got to know what to do, that's not, you know, if you can relieve moms from that pressure, boy, the life is much better. So just being formed, just engaging conversations, it shouldn't be about pointing fingers and blaming people and fear. That That's not the idea. Let's just yeah. talk about it. And again, just close your eyes and imagine living in the Middle Ages without a vaccine. I, mm. I swear to God, you won't want to go back. It's much mm. better now. And I do think that's part of the issue with hesitation around not just the COVID-19 vaccines, but vaccines in general is many of the generations now have never seen the devastating effects of diseases, even like even like polio, you know, we, we never saw that. So, you know, it's easy to say that, well, I'll, I won't take the vaccine, I'll, I'll probably be okay. And yeah. uh, because we don't understand, but I mean, look at the world right now, this is what the world looks like right now without a COVID or, or what looked like without a vaccine for COVID-19, how many millions of deaths that we've had, right? And, and what a year we've had. I remember when I was in primary school, there was a kid in my class that um, had polio and he had to use all those um, um, braces, strange things, he had braces in his, both of his legs. And I remember the first time I saw the kid, I asked my mom, what is wrong with this kid? I mean, kids are just sincere and honest. Yeah. And she said, he had polio. And mm -hmm. I said, what is polio? And she explained it to me and she said, but there is a vaccine. And I'm from that day on, I would take anything called vaccine that my mom would say, because I saw mm -hmm. that kid and I said, this kid is different. He can't run with us. He mm -hmm. can do things we can do. And I didn't want to go through that. Mm -hmm. It marks me. I, to this day, I can see the face of that child. Wow. Wow. I'll take any vaccine. <laughs> And that, that leads me to my to my next question, actually, because in Canada, we do have the, the privilege at this point, even though our vaccine supply is limited, it's kind of coming out very slowly, but we do have the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and we have the AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, soon the Johnson & Johnson. And because of some of the issues or the publicity that AstraZeneca has had recently, uh, some Canadians are maybe considering postponing their vaccination until they can get the vaccine that they that they want. This concerns me because we are in our third wave of COVID-19. We have a where cases are increasing almost almost everywhere. Um, what would be what are your thoughts on on this approach? I mean, we, it's coming from a place of privilege. I mean, even even us having this choice is is absurd because there's countries yeah. that would would do whatever they could just to get any vaccine. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the vaccines being applied in Brazil. Um, I, to be very honest, I think that, um, you know, AstraZeneca needs to hire somebody in communications because they, they really don't do a good job on that. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of those problems we are seeing now is because of their complete failure in communicating findings and, and, and yes. uh, handling with events that happen, those events are normal. They're extremely rare, mm -hmm. but then one case becomes like as if, as if 
90% of people got. So they need to do a much better job in communication. But what I would say is from everything that has been published, it is a safe vaccine. It is a good vaccine. So the best vaccine you can get is the one available to you. I just got an appointment, yay, for Tuesday. I have no idea which vaccine is going to be available to me because the site that I was assigned is offering all three, Janssen, Pfizer, and Moderna. I don't care. All of them are good. We can't, you know, look at those numbers, 95, 50 something. The thing is, we cannot compare those numbers. Each one of those vaccines was tested with a different sample at a different moment in time. Yes. Pfizer and Moderna were tested at times when you didn't have like the major explosion of cases. Mm -hmm. um, Jensen was tested um, in places that were going through unmitigated transmission, much higher. So we mm -hmm. can't compare those numbers. The point is they're all safe. They're all good. They all protect against severe cases and mortality. So please just get your appointment give your arm and take whatever vaccine is available. The one available is the best vaccine for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. And I, I hope to have a, an appointment coming up for myself soon as well. I just registered and I'm waiting to, to hear. I don't know what it'll be, but I will, I will take it. That's yeah. It's going to, it's, it's one, one more step, one step further to getting us, us out of this, right. One person at a time. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. This is this has been really fascinating. I just have a couple more questions, Marcia. Um, so you, I, I'm just wondering, moving forward, if we ever get out of this, or as we try to look forward, um, what do you think that governments need to invest in today to be able to respond better to future pandemics and to just have a more more effective and more more efficient response? That's a great question. I think after every public health emergency, we have those discussions yeah. and, and, you know, lessons learned and then something comes, we do everything wrong. Yes. Um, so I, I think there's one lesson from this pandemic, which, which is you can have the most resilient health system. Mm -hmm. If you have the bad politician, that's enough to destroy everything. So mm -hmm. politics matter much more. I mean, I don't think we've ever seen so clear in front of us how much mm -hmm politics can really, really create a major problem for the response. I agree. Um, putting that aside, because that's a major complicating factor, um, I think there are a few things. One is using health systems is really important. So we have a few examples. We have, uh, uh, um, they're all the smaller countries, of course, but, but countries that really use the health system and try to respond quickly. That's the key thing. So if you look at, for example, um, uh, I believe it was Taiwan that really suffered during SARS and wanted to mm. do the right thing now. And if you look at all the detailed plan that they had in place, they learned from before and then they did a better job now. Then you have uh, South Korea that the population trusts in the, in the government. So they had this monitoring 24 seven they could inform people, you enter in that store, somebody that went to that store had COVID. That would never be able to be used in the US because you know privacy and yes. it, the culture is different. But, but again, um, the health system was universal and they were able to respond using those resources. I think the other lesson is, um, you know, being in the community is important. And we have some localized examples in Brazil that they did use those agents that I mentioned before, mm -hmm. and it made all the difference. It made all the difference. Wow. Um, and then we have the lesson, the big lesson that we need better surveillance and both epidemiological surveillance, but genomic surveillance. And that has to be a global effort. It is a pandemic. Pandemics, by definition, are global. It affected everybody. Is this going to be the trigger, maybe spearheaded by WHO or whoever it is, to actually bring people together? And we're going to have to rely on, on the global north to help the global south to create right. this network, but to better prepare every country to actually pick up quickly things that may emerge in the future. Um, and I think it's going to raise a lot of questions about uh, solidarity. Um, 
I hope one of the legacies will be those collaborative groups that were created, people from different disciplines, from different countries working together. I hope this is going to stay. They are not going to suddenly yeah. disappear after the pandemic because everybody benefited. Yeah. Um, everybody learned from this. So I think there are a few things that if you really want to learn and, uh, you know, learn make a legacy of the positive things and try to fix the bad ones and just do a better job voting because we can't change politics, but that's the power we have. It's when we vote to try to choose the right thing. Then, I, I mean, I, I'm an optimist, so I think we can do a better job for the next one. But, you know, it depends on commitment. It depends on willingness to do the right thing. Um, it is my hope that we're going to be able to do at least some of that. But <laughs> It's my hope as well, Marcia, definitely. And Marcia, just uh, finally here, how do you see us getting out of this pandemic? Do you care to make any predictions on when that could happen or, or uh, what, other, what factors are, are at play here? Uh, that's hard. I mean, I, I don't like making predictions, but um, if, I, if I look at the case of Brazil, I... I'm sorry to say, but my answer is I have no idea. I mean, yeah. what we need right now, I can tell you what we read right now. We we need to have a lockdown right now mm -hmm. um, to be able to contain this thing. And as mm -hmm. we have this lockdown, we need to prepare our community health agents. We need to equip them. We need to buy. We have cheap tests that you can buy on the drugstore now. We need those tests. It's not serology. It's to test people, to identify people immediately when they're infected. We need to bring this into the response as well. So uh, we need to distribute better masks, uh, PFF2 in Brazil, which is like N95, um, for every single person working on the front lines. We still don't have that. So with planning, but it's starting from a lockdown and with planning, then we can bring those things down and we can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. My problem in Brazil right now is that I just see darkness. I, yeah. I don't see nothing. So I don't even know how to answer mm -hmm. your question. I know what we should do. Mm -hmm. I have no idea when we're going to get out of this because there is no indication that the federal government is going to support the, the mayors and the governors in doing what has to be done. So, um, yeah, I, I just have no idea. So that's fair. And I, I sympathize with that. And I will tell you that even in Canada, where we have, you know, leadership, and I mean, it, it has not been without some political play, uh, but w with us in this third wave, it's very concerning. And part of the reason I asked you that question is because as a Canadian, I have concerns as to when this is all going to end. And I think maybe a couple of months ago, we were all a little bit more optimistic because we thought, oh, vaccines are here. We are out of this. And we are seeing now these rising cases in Canada, but also things happening like in, like in Brazil. And we can no longer live like we are all just our own country. Um, like you said, this virus does not respect borders. We all live in one world and what happens in Brazil affects what happens in Canada and we need to, to pay attention because we all want to get out of this, but I think we, we're going to have to work together a bit, a bit better and hopefully somehow be able to, to help each other and realize that this is not going to be over, like they say, for anyone until it's over for everyone. Yeah. I think unfortunately what we have is the, the virus is universal, but the you know hospital care and the right yeah. response to the virus is not mm -hmm. so it's an unfair competition at this point in many places i agree um dr castro thank you so much for for your time do you have any any further comments or any any message to to canadians who are tired and maybe are not taking this very seriously anymore i am concerned for for my fellow citizens because you know we are all tired but now it's the variants are here vaccination is slow any anything you'd like to leave us with today? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you, Lindsay. Everybody's tired, but um, if we relax, then um, we're going to be tired and we're going to be sad because mm -hmm. uh, we're just going to have more transmission and then things get closer to us. Last mm -hmm. year, I didn't know anybody that died from COVID. 
this year I know way too many people so mm -hmm. it gets close to us so I know everybody's tired but the more we can comply and the more we can try to stick together because this is a community response yeah. this is a collective response I mean we cannot talk about I or me it has to be we sorry but in this pandemic it has to be so the more we can comply and the more we can try to comfort each other and stay together and try to move forward if we have to close we have to close if we have to use masks we have to use masks the more we can do this the faster we're going to get out of that but if we relax it's just going to take longer mm -hmm. and then if you're tired now it's going to reach a situation that is just unbearable so just do the right thing for a little bit more to increase the chances that sooner we can get out of this. But if you don't do the right thing now, I don't even know when when soon is going to be. So mm -hmm. it just has to be that way. Mm -hmm. I know everybody's tired. Um, I'm tired too, but we got to do it. I agree. I agree. Thank you, Dr. Castro, so much for this enlightening conversation and for just giving of your time for this interview that I think is of utmost importance. So, so thank you very much for, for joining us today. And I wish you all the best with your, your friends and family in Brazil and, and all your endeavors in the coming days and weeks. Thank you, Lindsay, and good luck to you and to your country. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.